Welcome, Welcome to, to Hero, Hero Club. Club. I'm Nick Williams. And I'm George Primavera. George and I started playing Dungeons and Dragons with our buddies in college, and we haven't stopped since. Even when we lived on opposite coasts, I would Skype in George on the TV in the living room of my apartment. While I would DM from the floor of my bathroom so as not to wake up my roommate. When I finally came out to Los Angeles, we started playing with our friends right away. And when we'd inevitably tell other people about the ultimate betrayals and daring heroics that happened in our games, we realized that they were just hearing a jumbled mess instead of the cinematic blockbuster memories that were in our heads. We wanted to show people how fun and immersive immersive D&D can be, especially those who had never played. And to do that, we record a full game like normal around the table and then painstakingly cut it down from four hours to a clean, math-free episode so you can experience our memories the way we do. Just like in a real game, nothing is ever written or planned out ahead of time with the players. The only things we add are music and sound effects. I am the dungeon master. I build the world and the framework for an adventure. The players, like Nick, must then journey through the obstacles I set before them, rolling a 20-sided die and adding character-specific bonuses to see if they succeed. If they beat the number I have in my head, then their action is successful. If not, it is a failure, and there may be consequences. We try to follow the rules of Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition as close as we can, but as the Dungeon Master, what I say goes, and there are some things I like to do differently. Each season is its own contained story, so find one that sounds interesting to you and start from the top. And hey, welcome, welcome to, to the, the club. club. So, yeah, we fucked up. Under the corruption of the Necronomicon, I had killed our lucky pal Ahern, and in the chaos, Millie had seen Charlie for what he really is. Charlie and I were each at our own kind of rock bottom. His a uh, little more literal than mine, but no more pleasant. Hero Club presents Paid Back in Spades, a Hank Blackstone mystery. Chapter 11 Dealt from the Bottom After a chaotic and nightmarish fight at the Central Park Boathouse, Charlie watches Millie Tate walk up the steps of her apartment building. Before she disappears inside, she looks back at Charlie, gives a small wave, and then, with her eyes downcast, walks inside. Charlie waves back, gives the slightest hint of a smile, and watches Millie go inside. The night air is especially cold and the streets are unusually abandoned. Charlie looks around, sees that nobody's near him, walks over to a curb, and sits down, taking in all that just happened. He puts his head in his hands and has a little moment to himself. A couple of cars roll by slowly. One of them honks at Charlie antagonistically, and several drunk men lean out the back, yelling at him. Hey, why so sad, big fella? A beer glass shatters on the sidewalk next to Charlie. Charlie's so in his own head right now that he barely notices any of the commotion around him. After about 20 minutes of silent reflection, Charlie suddenly feels something cold and wet on the back of his neck. What the? Turning, Charlie sees a very small, very skinny looking dog, wagging its tail, a little bit curious. Hey, listen, pal, uh, you seem like a happy dog and all, uh... I don't think you want to get mixed up with a guy like me. The dog sits and cocks its head to the side. Uh, yeah, there's really uh, nothing to see here, pal. Uh, just a, uh, you know, broken man. <laughs> Go, get out, scat. The dog recoils for a moment and then runs back up to Charlie, lifts its leg, and pees all over the sidewalk next to him. <sighs> I guess I deserve this. All right, come on, get off. Ugh, ew, <laughs> ew. And the dog flees and runs off into the night. What am I, a fire hydrant? Charlie takes this as a sign, finally steps up, and begins slowly ambling his way back to Dante's Inferno. After a short trip, Charlie walks through the doors and quickly ascertains that Hank is not present. All right, Hank. Oh, God. Charlie puts his head in his hands one more time. He's realizing that he barely had any time to think about Hank or Ahern or Jan. He just wants to go in his room and rest. Charlie puts his coat and hat on a rack in the living room and slowly shuffles his way into his bedroom. With a flump, Charlie lands on his mattress and is soon fast asleep. Charlie, 
make a wisdom save. Nat 20. It feels like only an instant, but Charlie, you suddenly sit straight up in your bed. Uh, 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 what? There's been a disturbance in the main room of Dante's Inferno. Hello? As soon as your feet touch the floor, you feel woozy. The world begins to shift a bit around you, and your eyes adjust, and you appear to be viewing all of the surroundings of Dante's Inferno through an odd kind of fog. Everything has an ethereal blue hue to it, as if peering through a filter, and you quickly realize you are in yet another very vivid dream. Oh no, I hate these. There are footsteps in the main room. Uh, uh, hello? Uh, is that, is that Hank in my dream? You hear the pouring of some coffee. Charlie walks through the door and into the living room. And sees Alphonse Moretti sitting there with a pot of coffee, jaw intact. Oh, you again, huh? To what do I owe the pleasure, Marble Mouth? In front of Marble Mouth, on a small wooden table, are three objects laid out in a perfect line. The clover, the prism, and Alvira's deck. There's another chair opposite Moretti. Charlie reluctantly goes to sit in the empty chair next to Marble Mouth. Well, you got me, so what? You've got a lot on your mind, Chuck. Oh, was it, was it that obvious? Well, in here, it's kind of been a whirlwind. So yeah. Yeah, well, uh, it's been a whirlwind out there too. You wanna cut to the chase? What, are you trying to scare me? Give me another nightmare? What's going on? Charlie, there's suddenly a little lilting tune in the air. A violin playing a very familiar melody, but it's coming from the vault. All right, I'll bite. What's in there? Charlie, I'm just trying to help you. Remember, I'm you. The things that are happening in there, it might explain what happened tonight. Why Hank lost himself. Yeah, Hank, that's right. He, uh, he killed the Hearn. Burned him to death. I, I... I've never seen Hank do that before. All right, um, you're saying the answers are, are through that door? Possibly, Charlie. I think the answers are just little things that you missed that kept piling up. You've both been a little distant. Yeah, yeah, I, <clears throat> I guess we have. The violin on the other side of the door becomes a bit more staccato. All right, well, I know I'm not getting out of this until I walk through that door, so... Ah, here we go. Into the vault. With a hiss, the doors open as Charlie approaches, without needing anyone to open them. Yeah, nice production value, Dream. And at the far end of the vault, there's a shadowy silhouette standing in front of the Necronomicon, which is splayed out on a wooden pedestal. The silhouetted figure jerks a violin bow up and down. Hello there. Um... I'm, uh, I'm Charlie. I heard you got some answers for me. The violin abruptly stops with a screech. The silhouette's figure is hunched and slender. It definitely looks like it could be Hank, but you've never seen Hank with hair so messy, and Hank has not been known to play the violin. Hank? Uh, is that you? <laughs> Come on, don't leave me hanging here. The violin drops to the figure's side, and the head of the silhouette just barely peeks behind. Roll a perception check, Charlie. Nine. The lighting is too austere, and you're not 100% sure who it is. Charlie gets closer to the figure, hoping to get a better look. And as soon as he gets within two feet, the silhouette turns, and it's clearly Hank. Hank, wh what happened to you? The light suddenly changes, and you see Hank's eyes are both milky white. Dark veins spiderweb up from his neck and across his face as he lunges toward Charlie suddenly. And then Charlie, in a flash of light, is sitting back in the chair in the main room of Dante's Inferno. The vault doors closed. What? What? Uh, uh, Hank? Hank? What, is, is this still a dream? What's, what's going on? Moretti puts his hand on Charlie from behind him. Oh, jeez. Oh. Hey, Chuck. What you see in there? Well, I didn't get a lot of answers. I saw Hank, but he was skinnier and his hair was longer, playing a violin and he was standing next to the Necronomicon. I, I don't know what to make of all this. I think my brain's just playing tricks on me. Well, Charlie, do you know 
where Hank goes every night? Uh, to his room? To sleep? Or, I, I don't know, maybe, what, does he go to the bar and, and I don't know about it? What, what's going on? The Necronomicon is dark, Chuck. Who knows what it could be doing to him? Are you saying that he's been reading the Necronomicon at night? Is, is that what all that crazy magic from before was about? D does he have new powers? or I Is he hiding this from me? Has he ever lied? Uh, I mean, I, sure, he's lied. He's lied to Dick McCoy. He's lied to, I mean, pretty much everybody in his life, but, but not me, never me. I, I, I'm Charlie. <laughs> he wouldn't lie to me. You sure about that, Chuck? Yeah, I, well, I thought I was. Ahern was supposed to be a friend. Yeah, but that was an accident, right? I mean, Hank would never kill somebody. Not, not somebody like Ahern. We're, we're trying to help him. But he did kill him, Chuck. Accident or not, he didn't think, he didn't care enough. No, I... <clears throat> I, I guess not. But why would he hide this from me? Why, why wouldn't he tell me that he's been reading this every night? Maybe because he's scared or ashamed. I'm his best friend. I, I, I would never judge him. I would never... I just want to help him. I, I don't know why he would keep that stuff from me. Well then, let's help him, Chuck. Alphonse gestures to the clover, the deck, and the prism. If you want to help him, here's what I think we should do. And suddenly, with an explosion, there is a massive hole in the wall of Dante's Inferno. Dust roils across the table, showering both Alphonse and Charlie with rubble. And then standing amidst the dust is a tall, broad-shouldered figure. <laughs> and Charlie's doppelganger steps through the hole. Charlie! Charlie, I don't know what it is, but something either in your mind or outside of it doesn't want you to find answers. Here, take all this. Alphonse scoops up the deck, Clover and Prism, and shoves them into Charlie. Uh, okay, what, what, I'm still so confused. What, what are you talking about? Find the answers. I'll hold them off. Come here, you big lug. Come get some of Alphonse. <sighs> the golem stalks forward, picks up Alphonse by the neck. <sighs> and with the other hand, rips off the bottom half of Alphonse's jaw. Oh my god! Charlie, make a charisma save. 14. Charlie, an indescribable fear suddenly grips your heart, and your legs beg you to run out of the room. Uh, 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 I, I gotta get out of here! Uh, I gotta get out of here! Uh! He busts the door open just as the golem shucks Marblemouth's body to the side and begins to pursue him. What do you want from me? Charlie desperately hits the call button for the elevator and eventually the doors open and the doors shut just as the golem is about to reach them. Uh, oh, oh my god, oh my god. The doors open once again and Charlie quickly busts out onto the streets of New York City. But as soon as he starts taking off down the sidewalk, he is overcome by a very odd sensation. It feels as though he's running backwards, although the scenery passes by him as if he is running forwards at enormous speeds. He fires through the streets of New York City, and as he does, he hears explosions and yells of fury behind him from the pursuing goal. Leave me alone! Leave me alone! <laughs> Charlie, checking over your shoulder reveals no golem behind you. But when you turn back around, you are suddenly back on the bridge, leading to Rikers, where your last dream started. What? What? The prison looms in the distance, and black, swirling voids border each side of the bridge. And standing in front of you is the golem with the dark black holes for eyes, and the mouth that is grinning just a bit too wide. Hey, you big guy. You know, my word of the day was doppelganger. Now, a ghostly counterpart of a living person, but you and I both know neither one of us is a person, Chuck. Get away from me! Stay away! Charlie tries what he's already done in another dream and dives off the edge of the bridge, hoping to escape the golem. Ah! 
But there is no meadow that greets Charlie. Instead, his velocity in the air increases, and then suddenly, out of a cloud of mist, he sees the bridge below him once again, and he impacts into the cement at a great speed. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh. Ah. Charlie, you take 64 bludgeoning damage, bringing you down to 71 points of health. There is an enormous crater in the bridge now. Ow! Dreams hurt. Charlie, make a charisma save with advantage. Eight. The golem stands above you as you slowly struggle to get up. Easy there, big fella. Don't want you making any more mistakes. Come on. And it reaches down and picks you up by the throat, standing you up. <laughs> ah, whoopsie daisy. Here we are, Chuck. Good to finally be able to tell you what it means to meet my other especially before he hands me the keys to the body that we both share. What the, what the hell are you talking about? <clears throat> Chuck, I'm you. I've always been here just waiting. Every kind word that you choked down when you really wanted to just ruin somebody's day. And every time you blow your top I get to come out and play for a minute, like this. The golem hauls back and punches Charlie so hard that he flies 25 feet back, tumbling into the cement. Charlie, you take seven points of damage, bringing you down to 64 points of health. Make a charisma save. 16. Success. Charlie is able to beat back the fear that has gripped his heart as he straightens himself. <sighs> if you got something to say, just say it. I'm sick of dancing around. I'm taking what should have been mine a long time ago. And once I finally get out of here, I'm just gonna have to wipe the slate clean, make some big changes, starting with every single person you ever loved. Because I couldn't stand them. I'd rather kill us both than watch you do something like that. Oh, I thought you would never, ever have the stones. And the golem opposite grows three feet taller, two feet wider, and stones begin to stick out all over the surface of its body. All right, big fella. Come on, come and get some. Charlie rages. Both Charlie and this other version of himself sprint towards each other. As they do, the anti-Charlie leaps into the air and throws its fist downward in a hammer arc and slams Charlie over the head. Charlie, you take three damage bringing you down to 61 points of health. After being knocked down, Charlie springs up and clocks the anti-Charlie under the chin in a jumping uppercut. 23. Hit. Roll damage. Seven. <laughs> Charlie grabs the anti-Charlie out from the air and attempts to slam him onto Charlie's bent knee. 20. Six damage. <laughs> Chips of stone fleck off of the creature's side, scattering across the bridge. The golem stands back up and attempts to grapple Charlie. Roll an athletics check, Charlie. 15. 19. The anti-Charlie effectively grabs Charlie around the neck and throws a kidney shot. Charlie takes five damage, bringing him down to 56 points of health. <laughs> I thought you were the champ, big Chuck. <laughs> I am the champ, little Chuck. Charlie throws his fist behind his head, attempting to punch Auntie Charlie's face as he has him grappled. 14. Miss. <laughs> the golem makes no reaction as your fist impacts in his chest. Charlie attempts to escape the grapple. Botch. Charlie kicks his legs uselessly trying to get loose, but the golem just continues to laugh and begins to walk Charlie over to the edge of the bridge, still holding him aloft. I know you like the view, Chuck. 
As the anti-Charlie holds Chuck over the edge, he throws two rabbit punches directly at Charlie's nose. But Charlie, you're able to lower your head in time, so the golem merely punches into your forehead. You take no damage. That's okay. Still a long way down, bud. Charlie reaches for the railing of the bridge with his feet, attempting to get back on. Roll an athletics check. 28. Beats the golem's 20. Charlie gets out of the grapple, flinging himself back over the railing and backing the golem up against it. (laughs) Charlie attempts to kick him off the railing. Nat 20. Aloha also means goodbye. Goodbye! Charlie firmly kicks the anti-Charlie off the bridge, the anti-Charlie's foot hitting the railing on his way down, causing him to spin wildly as he tumbles into the chasm. When it disappears into the swirling black void, there's a beat, and then suddenly the scream is heard from above you, Charlie, and you look upward and see the anti-Charlie falling out of the sky, spinning head over heels, flailing its arms. At great speed, the golem impacts in the bridge and shatters across the cement. Could somebody help me out here? I just kicked my own ass. Is that what you wanted? Charlie, make a strength save. 21. The bridge begins to shake and tremble, but you grab the railing in time so you don't lose your footing. The rocks shattered across the ground begin to reform and tumble back towards a central point. Very quickly, half of the golem's head is reformed as the other rocks begin to tumble back on top of each other. No, 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 no. There's an echoing laughter in the air. (laughs) Think you could just punch your way out of this one, Chuck? You said it first. Only way to get rid of me is to get rid of you. As you back up a few steps, the golem growing a little taller by the second, you hear a voice call out to you from behind you, from Riker's prison. Charlie! What? Marblemouth, is that you? Yeah, come on, he's not gonna stop coming. Yeah, I figured. Alphonse is waving you towards the prison like a third base coach desperately trying to get you away from the reforming creature. Charlie nods and sprints towards Alphonse. He lets you in first. Riker's prison is completely empty. But suddenly, there is screaming from down the hall. It's unmistakably Hank. Hank? Hank, you there? Dream Hank, you there? We gotta help him, Charlie. You got the stuff right, you didn't let him get it, right? Let me, uh... Before Charlie can even say look, he looks down at his hands, and the prism, the clover, and Elvira's deck are all of a sudden in his grasp. Good. We gotta get to him right now. Okay, lead the way. The two clatter down the hallway, their footsteps echoing more than they would normally, and you round the corner to where you remember Alphonse Moretti being held. But instead, you see Hank Blackstone strapped in with leather bindings and a mask over his face eyes rolled back into his head, screaming as if he's being electrocuted. Hank, what are they doing to you? Alphonse is struggling to open the bars. Hank, come on, open it up, we gotta help him. Help me out, Charlie, I'm I'm pretty weak. Charlie attempts to charge through the door and bust it open. Roll an athletics check. 21. The door bashes open, and soon Charlie is at Hank, who is convulsing. Hank, what's going on? Get him out of there, Charlie. Charlie unbinds Hank and cradles him in his arms. The convulsing ceases, and he breathes heavily. Hank, Hank, wake up. Uh, You remember me? It's your best friend, Charlie. Charlie, you got the stuff? Yeah, yeah, I got the stuff right here. Good. All right, quick, let me see it. Charlie shows him the stuff. All right, let's go. Hank picks up the clover in his hand and then the prism, examining it with a haggard look on his face, and then he looks at Charlie. And the deck? Yeah, yeah, I got it right here. He takes a look at the deck, opens the cover, checking that all the cards are there, and says, Okay, one second. Charlie grabs Hank's hand for a second and says, Are you sure you want to shuffle that deck? You know what it can do. I'm not going to do anything I don't have to. Trust me. And he exits the cell, grabbing the door behind him, 
and before Charlie can follow him out, slams the bar shut. What? Hank! Hank! The ethereal blue hue around everything dissolves before his very eyes. But Charlie's surroundings remain the same. Hank looks at Charlie and smiles. Sorry, Chuck. I'm not going to do anything I don't have to. But I want to do all of this. As the dissolve completes, Hank is no longer standing in front of the bars, but Alphonse Marblemouth Moretti. What? Marblemouth? What? what is this? Some kind of trick? Where's Hank? Police officers begin to file out of the hallways, staring at Charlie in the barred enclosure. There is nobody in the cell with Charlie, and Marblemouth steps back from the bars, cradling the prism, the clover, and Alvira's deck in his hands. Give me back the stuff. What are you doing? Oh, you think you're still dreaming right now, Charlie? <laughs> Dream time's over. Uh, okay, well, I, I know this is just, uh, gotta be me playing a prank on myself, right? So, uh, all right, come on, wake up, wake up. Charlie starts slapping himself in the face, attempting to wake himself up. Wake up, come on, come on, wake up. Make a wisdom save, Charlie. Eight. You are completely unsure if this is a dream or not. Wake up, come on, wake up. Charlie runs towards the bars of the cell and starts pounding on them, attempting to bend them. Roll an athletics check. 27. Charlie runs forward with his shoulder lowered, surely about to burst through the doors. And then suddenly, there is a long, high-pitched tone, and black tendrils begin to reach out of the prison cell floor and attempt to hold Charlie in place. Charlie, make a strength save. 27. Charlie bursts through the black tendrils that continue to try to reach for him and smashes into the door, almost knocking it off the hinges. And then every police officer draws their weapons and points them at Charlie. This isn't real! This isn't real! Ah! 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 This isn't real! This is a dream! This isn't real! See, boys, what did I tell you? Dream or not, he can still get out of that. If he bashes that door all the way down, kill him. My errand boy has fulfilled his purpose. He's useless to me now. Oh, God. <laughs> Dick. Where's Dick? Charlie, make an arcana check. Nat 20. You notice right away that none of the police officers have the purple hue in their eyes. They're all staring at Charlie with deep malintent. Charlie, make another wisdom save. This is just a dream. This is just a dream. 19. You are certain you are not in a dream. Oh, oh God, what is happening? A police officer steps forward. Sir, we're ready when you are. All right, boys, let's go pay our Illuminati friends a visit. I have an appointment with the supervisor. <laughs> and Marblemouth walks away from the cell, the police officers following in tow, a detachment of them leveling rifles at Charlie. Back, back up, up, pal, back, back up. up. Back. Marblemouth, no, what are you? I swear to God, I swear to God, Marblemouth, come back here. Earlier that evening, Hank stumbles through the door to Dante's Inferno, cradling a Hearn's burned corpse in his hands. He quickly ascertains that Charlie is not present and makes his way to the vault with a Hearn's body, the doors hissing open. There's a cold metal table at the far end of the vault that Hank slowly moves towards, unable to stop staring at a Hearn's lifeless eyes, and then he lays him out on the table. Hank, completely numb at this point, not breaking eye contact with a Hearn, throws his hat down on the table and rummages around in his coat pockets until he finds the clover. He pulls it out, looks at it for just a moment. <sighs> All that for this stupid rock, and then presses it into a Hearn's hand, closing a Hearn's fingers around it, resting on his chest. Hank, Make a charisma save. Nat 20. You feel the hairs on the back of your neck begin to stand up, and you quickly whip around to see that the Necronomicon is open, though still in its case. You hear an echoing voice in the back of your mind. You feel the book 
hug you towards itself, but you don't feel magically compelled to approach. Hank slowly walks over towards the book, puts his hands on either side of its glass case, and in one swift motion, flings the glass enclosure off of the pedestal and into the wall, shattering it. As the glass shatters, the book bounces and comes to rest, and then the pages flutter as if there is a wind gusting from nowhere, and it settles on the last page of the book. Once again, you hear the words, This time, there's no mistaking the words. And Hank, in horror, takes a few steps back from the book. Averting his eyes from Ahern's body, Hank grabs his hat and leaves the vault. Hank grabs his heavy black wool overcoat from a coat hook on the wall and brushes out the door to Dante's Inferno, finishing pulling his arms through the sleeves as he moves and not looking back. This time, he forgoes the elevator and heads down the emergency staircase. Hank? At the bottom of the staircase, you remember that you have a certain security measure in place for any who seek to enter. Hank almost never walks this way, but every time he does, he checks the several traps that he and Charlie have laid out to safeguard their inner sanctum. On each landing on each floor, Hank checks a trap. Hank finds nothing until the last trap at the very bottom of the staircase, a concealed hole in the floor. When he reveals the pit, He sees somebody lying at the bottom of it, completely unconscious. He makes out the face of Big Mick. Oh, God, not tonight. Hank closes the trap back up and heads out into the cold New York air, pulling his wool collar up around his cheeks as he does. After an hour, Hank passes Union Square Park and finds himself outside of a well-lit, very heavily decorated tavern, set up with full Valentine's Day regalia. The bar is very busy this time of night. Hank looks at the red tinsel and the pink string lights and just says, Nope, and keeps walking. Another three blocks up, Hank descends some stairs and finds himself at the door of a disgusting dive bar, the name of which is emblazoned across the rickety wooden door. The Rusty Moose. Oh yeah, that's more like it. Hank pushes the door in. Inside, there are several belligerent groups drinking very heavily. A few couples border the walls, canoodling in a very cozy sort of way. Hank approaches the bar, and a woman approaches to take his order. What can I get you, hon? Hank slaps down a crumpled $10 bill. Give me a scotch, double, and keep them coming until that money runs out or I pass out. All right, you got it. She takes the bill and begins pouring Hank his scotch. One drink comes, then another, then a third. Several of the couples have begun to leave the bar off to do whatever it is that the happy people do. Meanwhile, there's some uproarious laughter from behind Hank as several men begin to point and laugh at another who seemingly has spilled his beer all over the table. All right, all right. (laughs) My bad, okay, okay. Uh, I'll go get another one. He gets up and approaches the bar next to Hank. Hey, can I get two? Why the long face, pal? Hank ignores him and keeps drinking. He looks at Hank, jostles him in the shoulder very drunkenly. I was supposed to be home two hours ago. (laughs) Don't tell my wife. (laughs) Hank continues to ignore him, throwing up one finger on his glass to indicate to the bartender that he needs a refill. She obliges, also slapping down the two beers the man has asked for. Thank you, thank you, thank you! He takes both drinks and heads back over to his friends, accidentally kicking Hank's stool a bit. He trips forward, sloshing some of the beer all over the floor. Hank's fourth drink arrives, then his fifth, and then his sixth. Hank, make a constitution save with disadvantage. Four. Hank is plastered. Sweat begins to pour from his brow as he leans groggily over the counter. The bartender approaches. Hey, I think maybe you've had enough. Suddenly, a glass shatters from the table behind Hank, all of the men once again pointing at another of their compatriots. Oh, Mikey! You know what? You're right. I have had enough. Hank swivels in his chair so that he's leaning heavily on the bar with both elbows and calls over to the men. Hey, pal, 
Hey! The group of men goes silent as they all stare at the drunk Hank. I don't think your wife's gonna miss you. The group remains mute. You know what you said two hour that you've been gone for two hours and you didn't tell your wife? She's not gonna miss you. The man who Hank was speaking to earlier stands up, also drunk. Hey pal, maybe you ought to cut the gas. You wanna know how I know? That she's not gonna miss you? The man steps forward, putting his beard down a little warily. Oh yeah, why is that? Same reason I got thrown out back. She and I were doing the Mattress Mambo earlier, and man, it's fucking killing me now. All of the men back up from the table, as the drunk fellow that Hank is antagonizing steps forward a few more steps. And guess what? I'll bet you ten whole clams that I can get your wife to do it again in thirty minutes. Hank exaggeratedly looks the man up and down. Eh, make that fifteen minutes. You're one ugly son of a bitch. It shouldn't be that hard. Hank is pulled out of his stool by the man who is now directly at him. Oh, you are some kind of germ, pal. I'd hate to get you grody so close to Valentine's Day. <laughs> but I thought I already told you, mister. I already had my Valentine's date. The man is just about to drill Hank between the eyes before the bartender pipes up. Okay, pal. Whoa, whoa! Hey! Not in my bar? Take this outside. Oh, with pleasure. And he pulls Hank out the door as his friends follow behind. The crowd of men begin to laugh excitedly. As the man drags Hank out of the bar onto the sidewalk, he then pulls him into an alley, throwing him into the dirt bodily as the group of men block the exit to the street. The lead man starts to approach. All right, smart mouth. Welcome to the barber. I'm gonna give you a flat top and throws a vicious right hook right at Hank's chin. Hank lets it happen. Hank, you take five damage, bringing you down to 50 points of health. <coughs> uh, barber jokes. She said you were funny. All right, come on, get up, nosebleed. Hank stands up on his feet, shakily, but doesn't raise his hands in defense. So I can put you back down. Hank takes another five damage bringing him down to 45 points of health. <laughs> Had enough? Not even close. Hank spits up at the man. <laughs> Alright, boys. Let's split a wig. They all gather around Hank and begin kicking into every part of his ribs, legs, and face. Hank, you take 25 damage, bringing you down to 15 points of health. <laughs> After Hank is sufficiently beaten, the large drunk man picks him up by the collar and shoves him against the wall. Now say you're sorry, or else I'm gonna put your lights out. Hank, make a charisma save. Botch. Hank, the ringing in your ears is absolutely deafening all of a sudden. The black and white vision suddenly inverts, and you see everything in negative image. You hear the words in your head louder. Come on, pal, speak up! Wakey, wakey! And before Hank even knows it, he's screaming. Ferrantur Eu! All of the lights in the alley go out. Hank sees nothing but blackness, but suddenly feels energy stretch out from his fingertips, which are cast forward. And Hank, through the din, only hears some muffled screaming. What's that? Oh, 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 oh. Hank falls to his knees hard as he is released. He hears several more screaming voices and suddenly feels a surge of strength in his limbs. The pain in his ribs subsides. A broken nose straightens and clicks back into place. And then suddenly, the ringing stops, and Hank's vision returns after a few desperate blinks. And lying out around the alley are five bodies. Unmistakably, 
the men who had been beating Hank only seconds prior. They all lie in various positions, implying that they had been attempting to escape. And as Hank crawls roughly over to the man who had been holding him up against the wall, turning him over, he sees a sunken and shrunken face, as if the man had been vacuum sealed from the inside. Both eyeballs stare at Hank widely and in shock, bloodshot and hemorrhaged. Hank Blackstone? Yeah, uh, who's asking? You can call me Mr. 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 Hank, still reeling, turns slowly to Mr. Mr. Hank, your limbs are still shaking, but not from weakness anymore. From a kind of surging adrenaline. You are now at full health, standing at the entrance of the alley, holding a gun pointed at your chest. Is an Illuminati agent, though a completely different one, from the one that had visited you in your office. You're coming with me. The supervisor has some questions about what happened to Kit Rockefeller. You're a fatter, Mr. Mister, than the other one. <laughs> Thanks for noticing. Still with the gun pointed towards Hank, the man walks to the side door of the bar that Hank had just been inside of and rubs a yellow sticker onto its surface. Come on in. And I would think twice about running if I were you. If you were me, you wouldn't have a choice. Hank cups both hands in front of his face and blows, whispering, Scum I'll kill, and filling the alley with thick fog. As Hank is barreling through the fog, suddenly, a pair of bolos wraps his legs and arms up, and he falls bodily onto the ground. Ugh! <laughs> well, I told you. The fog suddenly disperses. <clears throat> Come on, you and he picks Hank up by the cords that are now binding his limbs to his sides. If the supervisor wants to have a word, she gets to. Hank attempts to kick up at the man, using his hands as leverage, aiming for his chin. Roll an attack at disadvantage. 17. Roll damage, unarmed strike. 2 damage. (coughs) Oh, that wasn't very nice. He pulls Hank to the door, turns the knob, and opens it. But instead of the busy and bustling Illuminati main hallway, he sees an absolute fiery ruin. Marble pillars scattered across the floor in pieces. Bodies lying across desks and furniture, most of which appear dismembered and distant, echoing screaming. What in the hell? In the moment of hesitation, Hank attempts to kick the man through the door. Roll an athletics check with disadvantage. 18. The man falls forward into the door. Using the momentum, Hank stands straight up and, like Harry Houdini, begins to wriggle out from the bolos. Roll a sleight of hand check. 24. The bolos come loose and drop to the ground. Hank holds the door closed with one hand and peels off the sticker with another. Right before Hank takes the sticker completely off the wall, he hears muffled on the other side of the door. And then the sound dissipates as Hank peels the sticker off the door. Hank, roll a nature check. Ten. Hank stands, hand on the door, panting, eyes wide, fully sobered up by the noise he just heard. It is unmistakably one of the doctor's monsters, a manual accumulator. Oh, Jesus Christ. Oh, Jesus Christ, we were right. We were right, I gotta tell Chuck. Chuck! Slipping on the sidewalk, Hank bolts down the alleyway and sprints back towards Dante's Inferno. Hank, make a perception check. 18. After 15 minutes of a full sprint south, back towards Dante's Inferno, Hank sees a cluster of people that have gathered up around a storefront window. A TV in color, flashing images that all members of the crowd appear to be enraptured by, gasping slightly as they turn to each other in shock, hands over their hearts and mouths. Hank catches his breath against the wall of the store and looks at the TV. And Hank sees a news reporter holding a stack of papers in his hand. There is no audio to be heard, but there is a poster board behind the newscaster that reads, Man of Stone Tears Through Manhattan 
and after a bit of silent speaking from the newscaster, the screen is suddenly filled by a fuzzy black and white image of a completely undisguised Charlie running through the streets. Hank stares at the image, mouth agape, for just a moment, and then takes off again with even more resolve towards Dante's Inferno. He finally reaches it, pushes through the doors, and sprints towards the elevator, slamming the button as many times as he can. The elevator dings and opens. Top floor, come on, Ern. The elevator rises. As soon as it reaches the top floor, Hank busts through the doors and is greeted with a splash as his boot squelches into a puddle of blood. Hank's eyes trace the puddle to a man lying with his back against Dante's Inferno's door. Sergeant Dick McCoy cradles a bleeding stomach wound. Hey, Hank, I made it. And then he passes out. Oh, Jesus Christ, Dick, Dick! Hank sprints over and practically slides on his knees down to Dick's level, trying to wake him up. Come on, come on, wake up! Make a medicine check, Hank. 18. After slapping Dick's face a few times, trying to wake him up, Hank remembers a vial of the red healing potion that he keeps on his person at all times. He desperately searches all of his pockets until he finds it, wrenches Dick's mouth back, and dumps the vial in. Come on. Come on! (coughs) Oh, thank Christ. Dick, what happened? Dick! Dick still looks pretty out of it, though his eyes are fluttering open. Hank, it's... it's Marble Mouth at the prison. He... (coughs) Dick spits blood into his own hand. No, 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 Dick, we, we gotta get you inside, come on. Hank shoulders Dick McCoy and pushes in the door to Dante's Inferno. Hank, roll an investigation check. 17. The vault door is open. Hank keeps his eye on the vault door, but gets Dick into the armchair next to the globe bar. He opens it up and pours a glass of the potion out. Here, just, just drink this, I'll, I'll, I'll be back in a minute. Just stay with me, okay, Dick? With great difficulty, Dick takes the glass and brings it to his lips. And instantaneously, there's a little bit more color in his cheeks. His breathing steadies a bit. Oh, okay. Oh, all right, that's it. That's it. Just keep that up, Dick, okay? Just don't, don't stop. Uh, All right, Hank. Hank, it's really bad. They got Charlie. Who got Charlie? They all got Charlie. Uh, Marblemouth and and the... And the commissioner and... and all the... Oh, this hurts so bad. Hank grabs a bar rag off the cart and presses it onto Dick's wound. Hold that tight and stay focused, Dick. Where did they take Chuck? They didn't take him. He... he walked into Rikers. He just walked... walked right in. What do you mean he walked in? Dick grabs you by the collar. I mean he walked in, Hank! Hank remembers the grainy photo on the TV. Dick... what did he... Look like? Looked like all of his skin was burned off. Like he was made out of gravel or something. But it was his voice. I heard him yelling. Well, Dick, what did he do when he got there? He, he gave... Gave Marble Mouth some, some stuff. And then he started freaking out when all the... Everybody, they just did what he said. Right when he said it. They all put him in a cell and... And Marble Mouth walked out with all the cops, and I tried to run, and I got a ferry, and then I, I looked down, and somebody had shot me in the back. Dick is clearly not making quite a lot of sense, getting lots of wires crossed. He appears to be in shock. Dick, what stuff did he give him? I don't know, like a rock and a crystal and then a box? Hank pushes off the chair and runs towards the vault. And Hank instantly sees a few things. The first is a Hearn's body. The hand in which Hank had pressed the clover is open and empty. The pedestal that the prism had been sitting on has been shattered and destroyed. The prism is, of course, missing. And then finally, the vault in which Elvira's deck is kept is ajar. Hank, make an investigation check. 30. The Necronomicon is open and back on its pedestal. Still open to the last page. Make a charisma save, Hank. Seven. Hank, your vision goes dark for a moment. The ringing in your ears returns, and a voice echoes in your brain. Quodest debitum solvit. And before your eyes, 
the Necronomicon dissolves into black shadow. The black shadow floats in a hazy ball before suddenly spreading outward a bit and then extending down to the floor. And then there is a shadow shaped like a man standing in the middle of the vault. Juxta conditum revertara de Diego, Hank Blackstone. And then the hazy black figure disperses and disappears. Hank, dread overtakes you at these words, though you don't quite understand them. With the words still ringing in his head, Hank runs into Charlie's room and rifles through his bookshelves, looking for his Latin translation book. Roll a history check with advantage. 15. The words translate to, I will be back for you, Hank Blackstone. Hank stares at his scribbled translation on the page, in abject horror. He tears the page out and walks back out into the main room, shoving it into his pocket as soon as he sees Dick. What was that? What was that voice? That was tomorrow Hank's problem. Hank feels the dark power surge through his body once again as his anger spikes. Now put on your goddamn dancing shoes. We're going to Rikers. Hit it, boys! Yeah, just like that. Watch your step when you step outside. The roads are narrow and the river's wide. And no one knows what waits inside. So watch your step when you step outside. Outside. When the path is slick The shadows here can play a dirty trick And moonlight's such a fickle guide So watch your step When you step outside You want your freedom This has been a Hero Club production Produced by Nick Williams, George Primavera, and Jack Quaid With associate producers Marty Abbey Schneider and Dylan McCullum Voice acting by George Primavera, Nick Williams, Jack Quaid, Dylan McCullum, Matthew McCullum, Aaron Rice Carlson, and Adam Rice Carlson. Theme song written and performed by Matthew McCullum. Special thanks to Kevin McLeod and Ben Doyle for their amazing music, Mage Hand Press for their genius D&D 5th edition homebrew, Marty Abbey Schneider for his incredible artwork, and Ali Catanese, our hero. Thanks for listening to the penultimate episode of Paid Back in Spades. This Blackstone mystery will conclude in just two weeks, but in the meantime, keep tuning in to members only and our social media at Hero Club Podcast to keep in the loop about some super exciting new stuff coming up the road. And hey, welcome to the club. The dolly shot. All right, so let me just get a let me get a few of those a few of those good ones in. Ah, uh, 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 testing it out. All right. Uh, don't don't use that marble mouth. <laughs> you scoundrel. <laughs> <laughs>